Here we go, Great American Bash 99, taking place in Baltimore, Maryland on June 13th. WCW Nitro has been abysmal over these past few weeks with even the company's usually decent mid-card not living up to expectations. WWF Raw has more or less doubled Nitro in terms of viewership, and right now we're just holding on to hope. Hope that WCW can deliver some surprising matches and moments on pay-per-view. 11,500 are in attendance, 185,000 have bought the show on pay-per-view, which isn't great at all. But to put it into perspective, next year's Great American Bash brings in 100,000 less pay-per-view buys. So <laughs> we're on the Titanic folks and we've very nearly hit the iceberg. Still, as mentioned, I hold on to hope. Maybe we were all too harsh and maybe there's some gold to be found during these dark days in WCW. So let's take a look. 10 seconds into the pay-per-view and I found the gold I was looking for guys, Doug Dillinger and Master P sharing a fist bump. Who does Doug Dillinger think he is? Master P and his crew of No Limit Soldiers are here in Baltimore and Kurt Hennig approaches the entourage, saying he's bout it bout it, he's true to the game and he loves rap music. <laughs> Since Master P respects Kurt, he wants to give him a signed CD, so Kurt thanks Mr P before showing him how much he really respects rap music. Kurt breaks the CD before running off, so it's fair to say Master P and his bunch of merry men will be coming after Hennig later on. Brian Nobbs vs Hardcore Hacks are opening match, I can hardly contain my excitement. The problem here is that these hardcore matches on pay per view always feature the same guys and it's always the same story. They want to prove they're the king of hardcore, yet nobody cares at all. You know what would sort this problem out? A hardcore belt. But at this point it's already too little too late and seeing as it's the same 4 guys having hardcore matches every week, a championship belt would mean very little. This is billed as a candlestick match but that doesn't make a difference at all. Nob says it's Mrs Nasty's birthday today and he promised his wife he'd beat Hack up for her tonight at the Great American Bash, what a complete tit. Our candlestick match begins with a trash can shot, yeah, Bran uses the trash can and the trash can lid to do more damage, but when he tries to use a chair, Hack gets the boots up. With Nobs on his back, the former Sandman heads to the outside to grab himself a ladder, he launches it at his opponent and it grazes Bran's back, and even though Nobs picks the ladder up in an effort to punish Hack some more, it's the hardcore original who turns it around by pulling off a slingshot leg drop. The artist Selen's completely thrown out the window as Bran gets up and he throws Hack into the ladder. Chair shots get followed by more trash can shots, Bran puts that ladder to good use but so does hardcore Hack. Hack then goes upstairs and he misses a somersault senton, so Jimmy Hart decides that this is when the match should end and he holds up a chair for Bran. Hack ends up throwing Nobs into that steel chair, he then hits him with his trusty candlestick, and hardcore Hack wins the opening match at the Great American Bash. It was nothing special at all. Q Morris runs down to beat up Hack. Morris and Nobs are part of Jimmy Hart's first family along with the Barbarian. Jerry Flynn's also going to join the faction very soon, and there you have it, stable of the year material. Morris pulls off the no laughing modern moonsault, while Nobs uses a trash can when jumping off the top rope. Roddy Piper reminds Buff Bagwell that if the Hot Rod regains control of WCW tonight and if he beats Ric Flair, then Bagwell's gonna get a big opportunity in the company. He's gonna get the ball. Bagwell says he's got Piper's back tonight, but Roddy Piper isn't the man who needs backup. Mikey Whipwreck then took on Van Hammer in a complete throwaway match. Van Hammer's been on a winning streak as the company try for the fourth or fifth time to get this guy over, and it was decisions like this that made Whipwreck reconsider his employment with WCW. For viewers at home, it's a match no one cared about. Mikey wasn't featured on Monday Night TV hardly at all, while Van Hammer was beating lower mid card guys during toilet breaks. So there's a real lack of investment here from the fans, and WCW wanted those same fans to buy this show on pay. Pay per view, it's a joke, really. 
Mikey took the top rope bail like an absolute champ though, it's a good looking move and made even better thanks to Whipwreck. And one of the more unique moments of the match was when Hammer dropped Mikey onto the guardrail after walking up the ring steps, but from here it got pretty standard. Mikey hits a top rope clothesline though his second effort gets snuffed out, Van Hammer then hits his Cobra Clutch Slam and Van Hammer beats Mikey Whipwreck on pay per view, absolutely terrible. It was a bad move to pencil this match in in the first place and it was a bad move to have Whipwreck job out to Van Hammer. As explained earlier, Roddy Piper said he wanted to give Buff Bagwell a chance if he becomes president of WCW later on. Disco Inferno took exception to this and he ended up having a match against Buff Daddy later on Nitro. Bagwell defeated Disco clean as a whistle in the Nitro semi-main event, so I have absolutely no clue why these two are wrestling again just 6 days later. Disco thought Bagwell should have been tougher on Piper. For those unaware, we are in the middle of a storyline where the young talent are getting fed up with the older wrestlers in the company and this is all well before the new blood angle too. But even with this in mind, Buff already beat Disco clean so this is pointless and highly predictable. The fans are clearly behind Buff Daddy tonight as the two go at it, Disco strikes first with a swinging neckbreaker and Buff's forced to the outside, seems like Buff's still having some issues with his neck. Disco mocks his opponent before Bagwell gets back in the ring, the fans chant Disco sucks as the two lock up, and Bagwell pays Disco back with a swinging neckbreaker of his own. Buff then softens up the arm before bringing Disco to the corner for a few punches, he then feigns a blockbuster attempt and Disco almost shits in his flares, so Disco takes a break on the outside and when the match eventually resumes, Buff shows off his Disco dancing skills before flipping the inferno off, how nice. Disco repairs Buff with a stun gun followed by a clothesline, Bagwell then takes an inverted atomic drop and Disco chokes his opponent out on the apron. We see Disco's second rope elbow drop but just like the Nitro match earlier in the week he fails when trying it a second time. Bagwell then gets another opportunity to go for his finisher but Disco knocks him off the top turnbuckle and on the outside Disco performs the chart buster, he really should have did that inside the ring you know. Disco tries to get a count out victory, Buff makes it back inside, so Disco goes for a pile driver but before he does that he feels Bagwell's ass while doing the Macarena. This, uh, this was a step too far for Mr Bagwell and Buff fires up with right hands, a back elbow and a drop kick. Our match ends with Bagwell finally pulling off the blockbuster and Buff Daddy wins as predicted. The best match on the card so far but that's not saying much either. Kurt Hennig's on a crusade against rap music. Rey Mysterio and Conan have aligned themselves with DJ Ran and other hip hop artists who have seemingly invaded WCW, so Kurt found himself a friend in Bobby Duncan Jr and these two are out to destroy Conan, Rey and rap music in general tonight on pay per view. Hennig and Bobby have the rap is crap theme song here but there's no lyrics except for the words rap is crap, we'll have to wait a few weeks before hearing the full version and this could mean disaster for one Steve Blackman. Master P watches this one from the audience and before the match Ray says Much love and respect to all my no limit soldiers you can see why people began cheering for Kurt and Bobby, right? WCW's audience were just not ready for this, it's the wrong audience, plain and simple. For every one fan who liked rap music and more specifically Master P, there were 20 others who couldn't care less. Kurt says Master P's latest track makes the rapper sound like he needs to use the toilet, he's talking about the song Oh Nae nee, nee, by the way, and our match begins with Ray and K-Dog jumping Kurt and Bobby from behind, and look at Kurt's bump after taking an assisted dropkick from Ray. <laughs> The match goes to the outside and it's here where Master P slaps Kurt Hennig. What does the P stand for in Master P? Let me look this up. Um, uh, Percy? Are you fucking kidding me? Master Percy? What exactly is Percy a master of? Um, One Stop Hip Hop says he's a master entrepreneur, hustler and hip hop general. Okay. Conan performs a float over bulldog and Ray excites with a head scissor takedown, a drop kick and a plancha, his springboard crossbody gets countered with a backbreaker and Bobby Dum Dum drops Ray with a power bomb. From this point on Ray's gonna get singled out and Conan won't get tagged in until the finish, so you know exactly what to expect here. Conan even gets a tag but the referee doesn't see it. Ray's kept in the opposition's corner as Master P and his No Limit soldiers watch on from the audience. Conan desperately wants tagged in but he has to watch on as Kurt performs a knee lift, his cocky follow up pin gets broken up by Conan and Mysterio has a chance to cover Kurt, but Bobby makes the save and Kurt then pays tribute to Ravishing Rick Rude by doing Rick's famous pose, you love to see it. 
After suffering even more punishment, Ray tags in Conan, but once again, the referee doesn't see it. WCW referees, man, they're so bad at their jobs. Finally, the official tag gets made after Ray counters a snake eyes attempt and Henny gets kicked in the face. Conan comes in with a K-Factor face buster while Ray goes for a Bronco Buster. I always talk about X-Pac missing the standing Bronco Buster every time he tries it, but a little miscommunication here leads to Ray almost pulling off a standing Bronco Buster. Kurt forgets to get in position and Ray has to perform the move again, but yeah, we almost saw the move that X-Pac wishes he could do. By the way, Ray's Bronco Buster is now known is the Rough Rider. Conan ends up on the outside and Barry Windham runs down to launch an attack. This prompts Big Swole, Master P's kayfabe bodyguard, to jump the guardrail and Bobby D gets clocked. Ray then scores the pinfall win after a slingshot leg drop and on the outside the No Limit Soldiers fight with Windham and Kurt Hennig. Master Percy and his group get brought back up the rampway by security and this means Hennig, Windham and Duncan Jr are left all alone to beat up Conan and Ray after the bell. This match was definitely better than Disco vs Buff and it's not only good that Kurt Duncan Jr and Wyndham are getting involved in a storyline, but it's also good that Conan and Ray have found something to do too. It doesn't matter if you don't like all this No Limit Soldier stuff, it's still better than doing nothing, I think. The next bout was supposed to be Ernest Miller vs Scott Norton in like their 20th match against each other, but instead Horace Hogan came out to take Scott's place. This is some grade A bullshit right here because this is another match we just saw this week on Nitro. Miller used the crowbar to beat Norton last week and this week on Nitro he did the exact same thing on Horace, so Horace says he watched the tape back and he saw how Miller screwed him over during that match. Horace wants revenge, we instead get Hogan Jr vs Ernest Miller and it's another match that no one wants to see. Miller said Horace better shut up or he's gonna go outside, get his karate gi and whip everybody's ass inside the building tonight, but Horace gets in the ring and the match is on. A standing sidekick floors Horace and the cat then decides to throw Hogan out of the ring. Sonny Ono gets in a few cheap shots and this allows Cat to go in control, but all the damage Miller does here means nothing seeing as he gets body slammed the second the two return to the ring. The match ends when Sonny Ono jumps on the apron but Horace is able to send Ernest to the outside. Sonny then puts a red shoe on Miller and Miller hits Horace with a super kick before throwing the shoe out of the ring and scoring a pinfall victory. So fellas, is it illegal to wear a shoe in a wrestling ring? I know someone out there is going to get all specific and say things like footwear needs to be approved or a shoe heel can't be bigger than 2 inches or some stupid shit but come on, I've seen plenty of guys wrestle in cowboy boots with no repercussions. You could say Ernest used the element of surprise and Hogan wasn't expecting to get kicked while Miller was wearing a shoe, but that would be just overanalyzing the whole thing and this finish doesn't deserve such in-depth coverage. 10 out of 10 for Miller's post-match dance though, that's something you really can't complain about. Ric Flair vs Roddy Piper takes place next. Their match last month was bad to an almost surprising level, you don't expect miracles but you expect something better than what we got, and you know, I would have been hopeful that both guys would make a real effort to right the wrongs of their slamboree encounter but I've been so disappointed with WCW lately that I can't really envision these two having a good match right here. Roddy Piper spits on Flair so we're off to a wonderful start, Flair chops Piper, Piper chops Flair 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 times and there's a back body drop right there. Piper performs his corner super combo and already we see the flare flop, we go to the other corner for more chops followed by a poke to the eyes, Randy Anderson then has to step in to save Flair from getting destroyed and Rick's able to briefly take advantage though it doesn't last too long. The ref and Flair push each other even though Randy just saved Flair from getting his head caved in, Piper throws a right hand that leads to Rick leaving the ring for a timeout, and you know what, as bad as I think this has already been, the crowd are completely eating it up, the Baltimore audience are stomping their feet and clapping their hands, so credit where it's due. Piper keeps an eye on Arn Anderson as the match resumes and it's all Piper once again. Flair tries to beg for mercy but Piper says F you before going back to work and so far Flair's done nothing but play defense. Finally Rick does something and you guessed it, it's a low blow. Piper gets thrown to the outside where Arn Anderson gets in a few cheap shots and when Roddy gets back in the ring Asia rakes his face from the outside. 
Another low blow brings Piper to the mat and when he gets up we go through the flare bare ass routine as Roddy pulls the nature boy's tights down. And speaking of routines, Flair gets launched off the top rope when he goes up for an aerial attack. Eventually Piper locks in his signature sleeper hold but Flair shoots Piper off the ropes and Roddy gets distracted by double A. Rick then pulls out those brass knucks that don't look like brass knucks but we'll call them brass knucks anyway and Piper gets clocked. Roddy kicks out of the follow up cover so Rick applies the figure 4 while the enforcer gives his old buddy a little help from the outside and that's when Buff Bagwell comes out to help Roddy Piper. Buff gets in the ring and the ref calls for the bell so I think Piper's just been disqualified. Buff fights Rick while Roddy stands back, we think Piper's happy with Bagwell's actions but then Piper attacks Bagwell and I have no idea what's going on here. Double A comes in to hit a spinebuster on Buff, Anderson and Flair then hold Bagwell down while Piper whips him with his belt, so either Piper's upset at Buff costing him the match, or Piper played Bagwell all along and just like Flair, he's not prepared to give any of the young blood in WCW a fair chance. The referee announces that Ric Flair is the winner and therefore Ric Flair is still president. When Flair leaves the ring, Roddy Piper continues his attack on Buff Daddy. Roddy Piper's turned heel, I think, and it looks like the story of the young versus old is going to continue in World Championship Wrestling. The match was awful by the way, in saying that though, not that it's much of a consolation, but I didn't feel as annoyed by this one as I did when Flair wrestled Piper at Slambury. Rick Steiner and Sting had a cage match a few weeks ago on Nitro. The newly arrived Tank Abbott refereed this match and it all ended with Abbott attacking Sting and Rick ended up having his way with the icon. Sting wants to get a little payback so we've got ourselves a Falls Count Anywhere match tonight at the Great American Bash. Scott Steiner said on Nitro this week that Sting has no friends and no one to back him up tonight, but Lex Luger showed up to offer Sting a little assistance and maybe Lex is going to help the Stinger tonight if Big Papa Pump gets involved in this matchup. We go in and out of the ring multiple times after the opening bell with neither man maintaining any kind of advantage. The Stinger drops Rick on the guardrail and after a bit of back and forth the dogface gremlin smacks Sting with a bottle of coke. The drink goes all over Sting and so Sting gives Rick his receipt moments later. Rick gets choked out with some TV cord before the icon lines up a Stinger splash, but Rick moves out of the way and Sting crashes into the guardrail. Comedy gold follows when Rick pulls up the protective mat on the outside only to pile drive Sting right on that same protective mat, yeah. But things improve drastically when Rick performs a German suplex in the ring. It's incredible how effective the standard stuff is really. Speaking of things improving, there's a chin lock right there from the DFG. Real wrestling ladies and gents. Rick tries to drop all his body weight on his opponent but Sting gets the knees up and the icon follows up with two consecutive Vader bombs before going to the top rope. Sting jumps off with a big splash but Stanner still kicks out of two. Rick replies by stretching Sting out a bit but it's an ineffective strategy as the Stinger gets up and he's able to deliver two Stinger splashes before applying the Scorpion Deathlock. Rick gets to the ropes, the referee breaks it up and then we go to the outside for the match finish. Sting suplexes Rick on the rampway before bringing him to the WCW.com area. We then see Chris Jericho calling the action and this is noteworthy seeing as Jericho hasn't been mentioned on TV in a very long time. Chris was being kept off weekly TV because he wouldn't sign a new contract. The two competitors then head to the back and guys get ready for this because it's unintentionally hilarious. A finish so bad that it makes you wonder how it got approved. After walking back through the curtain, Tank Abbott attacks Sting, wrapping a towel around his neck to choke him out. Sting's got the towel in his hand as Scotty Stanner calls for a doggo to come and attack the Stinger and as the dog jumps up we can see that this is some stunt dude dressed up as Sting. The hair completely gives it away. We then cut the footage of the real Sting who now has that towel magically wrapped tightly around his hand as the cute doggo tries to bite him and then it's back to the shit Sting as another doggo joins in on the action. Scotty then brings another dog and we see Doug Dillinger and the boys running to Sting's rescue or should we call him Dog Dillinger? Huh? Uh, this is how it all ends folks, the cameras cut back to the arena where we hear a chorus of boos and I'm lost for words, I'm really lost for words. Rick and Scott then drag the referee out and Scott orders Mickey J to award the match to Rick. Scott says Rick pins Sting, WCW were just too afraid to show it, they're protecting their golden boy and it was too violent to show anyway. So Rick officially wins this match and yeah this pay per view might even be worse than Slambury and we've only got two matches left. 
Scott tells the fans to bow down to the Steiner brothers. He also says WCW sucks and that's why both he and Rick are in the NWO. And Rick wraps it up by saying Baltimore's the shittiest town in America. Saturn and Chris Benoit defeated DDP and Bam Bam Bigelow for the tag team titles on Nitro. Chris originally teamed up with Ric Flair, but when Flair double-crossed him, Saturn ended up taking the Nature Boy's place. After the bout, Chris Kenyon turned his back on Saturn to join DDP and Bigelow, and so we now have the Jersey Triad in WCW. If the Triad win this match, then they'll benefit from the Freebird rule, but tonight it's DDP and Kenyon who are going to face Benoit and Saturn, and the tag team titles are up for grabs. This has match of the night potential, even if this show was good up until this point, it would still have match of the night potential. And we start off with Benoit and Kenyon, as Shivani hilariously says the commentary team will keep us updated on Sting's condition if they get any news. Benoit performs a dropkick before throwing Kenyon high into the air, the match breaks down and the champs send their opponents out of the ring, and so the triad regroups on the outside before our match resumes. Saturn and DDP then tag in, although DDP is able to soften up the arm and shoulder, Saturn comes right back with a drop toe hold, a power slam and an impressive springboard leg drop. All four men end up inside the ropes again and again it's the champs getting the better of the challengers here. So another meeting between the Jersey boys takes place and it proves to be futile as Saturn and Benoit perform tandem German suplexes on the challengers. A little assistance from Bam Bam Bigelow finally gives the triad the upper hand. DDP delivers a short arm clothesline to Benoit while Kenyon hits a second rope famouser. Benoit is able to hit a back suplex when DDP tags back in, but a low blow puts Chris on the mat and we're now just waiting for the hot tag. It comes sooner than expected, Kenyon misses a moonsault and this allows Saturn to come in and the crowd comes alive when Perry goes on offense. He delivers a top rope splash to DDP but he only gets a 2, and when he goes up for some mounted punches, Kenyon puts his fire out with an electric chair face buster. Once again, the triad utilized Bam Bam Bigelow to take control of the match and we're now building towards another hot tag. There's a basic yet highly effective front chancery spot where Sadar needs to push Kenyon into his corner to get that all important tag, but Kenyon blocks Perry from doing so. Eventually DDP misses a corner splash and this allows Benoit to tag in. Kenyon comes in too and Chris starts going after both his opponents, but it's Chris Kenyon who gets the worst of it as Benoit hits three German suplexes followed by a dragon suplex that very nearly ends the match. Benoit delivers a diving headbutt to Kenyon while DDP catches Saturn out with a diamond cutter at the exact same time. Saturn then rolls out of the ring and Dean Malenko comes down to help Perry back up, but this distracts the referee. Bam Bam Bigelow is able to get inside the ropes and Benoit gets hit with the Asbury Park cutter. DDP puts Kenyon's arm over Benoit and we now have new tag team champions. Dean Malenko, in effect, cost Saturn and Benoit the tag team championships, and the Jersey Triad thanks Malenko by dropping him with a cut or two. As predicted, this was the best match on the card, easily. It's not enough to recommend this pay per view at all, but it was still a decent matchup. Randy Savage is gone insane once again, and it's this insanity that brought him a WCW title opportunity tonight at the Great American Bash. It started off with Macho embarrassing Nash by smearing lipstick all over his face, and it quickly degenerated into poop jokes when Nash emptied the contents of a dozen septic tanks into Macho Man's limousine before getting a very flexible young lady to pour a bucket of wet shit all over Randy's head. Things then got a bit more serious when someone driving a white Hummer crashed into a limousine, a limousine that had Kevin Nash inside of it. No one knows who was behind the wheel, but the commentators believe Macho's got an ally who's just as dangerous as the Macho Man himself. That's what we've got here folks, nothing more, nothing less. Randy also wrestled a match against Sting this past week on Nitro and he was absolutely terrible. There were zero wrestling moves throughout the whole match except for a pile driver to the referee, all strikes, all chokeholds and I hate to say this because I'm a fan of both Randy and Kevin Nash, but after what I've seen on Nitro these past few weeks, my expectations are extremely low for this main event. It's the Macho Man vs Big Sexy, the world title is up for grabs, time for the Great American Bash 99 main event. Kevin Nash is not at 100% for this match. The commentators are putting over the Kev still hurting pretty bad from the limousine incident on Nitro, and maybe he should have thought about forfeiting this match. 
Mike Tanay also says the top rope elbow drop was reinstated at the request of Kevin Nash this past week on Thunder, as Big Sexy goes to work on the challenger. Savage gets brought to the corner for a few knee strikes and in the opposite corner Macho takes Nash's back elbow and we then see a corner clothesline that seems to hurt Kev just as much as the Macho Man. Nash then pulls off a sidewalk slam and Nash again sells his injured ribs. Macho smells blood and so he goes for the kill with a few strikes to the midsection. And here we go. Eye rakes, punches, chokeholds and kicks from the Macho Man. At least this time Macho has a specific target but I'm confident that this is the only kind of offense we're going to see tonight from Savage. Maybe an elbow drop too if we're lucky. Randy does some damage at the guardrail and Medusa gets a kick in for good measure. Randy keeps Nick Patrick busy so Medusa can get in another few shots before Kev gets back in the ring. The Macho Man then resumes choking Nash out before laying in more punches in the corner and Kev has to hit a low blow just to buy himself a little time. While the referee is distracted by Medusa, Miss Madness dives off the top rope with a missile dropkick. It's a little ironic that Macho's valets hit the best move of the match so far. Macho then goes upstairs and there it is, the diving elbow, but Nash kicks out a two and Macho complains to Nick Patrick. He complains about Nick's stupid perm and he complains about Nash kicking out. Kev comes back with snake eyes followed by a big boot, Macho finds himself in position for the jackknife powerbomb and Nash pulls off his finisher. So Team Madness jump in the ring to stop Kev from retaining his championship. Just as Nash hits Snake Eyes on Miss Madness, we see an old Relive in the War original enter the ring. Sid Vicious has returned to WCW guys, so it's time to kick or be kicking. <laughs> My god. Sid takes Kev out with a big boot, the referee calls for the bell as Sid powerbombs the champ in the middle of the ring, a real sight to behold. And that's how it ends folks, Kevin Nash is still world champion, but it now looks like he has a pretty big problem to deal with. This must mean it was Sid driving the white hummer, the commentators come to the same conclusion. But remember, this is WCW so I wouldn't bet any money on it. Seriously, as obvious as it is, these guys tend to mess us around when things like this happen. Also, notice Miss Madness holding her arm out quite awkwardly as she walks back up the ramp with Team Madness. She landed badly after taking Snake Eyes and it looks like she might be seriously hurt. Either that or she's doing a wonderful sale job. The main event wasn't good but Sid coming back at the end was great. The tag team championship match was also decent and the Kurt Hennig tag match was fine too. The rest of this show was pretty bad. It's so bad at times that it feels like self sabotage. The card itself was pretty shocking with two matches taking place that also happened 6 days ago on Nitro and the amount of interference or dodgy finishes we had at this show was also a complete joke. You can overlook this kind of thing on Nitro because well we're used to it by now and you'd also also accepted if it happened just a few times on a single pay per view, but 7 matches in total had some sort of screwy finish that either included someone getting involved or someone cheating to win. And that's just overkill, plain and simple. I wasted a whole day watching, scripting and recording this shit while my poor editor had to go through those recordings in painstaking detail. So you, dear viewer, have to do something for us. Please press the like button, subscribe to Wrestling Bios and we'll call it even. Thank you for watching guys, I do appreciate it and I'll see you all next week for Reliving the War. Take care.